These portraits say in addition, I was an object of respect and envy. I had only to raise my hand to receive attention. Everybody's clothes indicate social status. But the clothes and feathers and jewellery of these women make exaggerated claims. It is their clothes, not their faces, which dazzle. The faces of women in many European paintings are like the faces of swimmers in seas of silk and satin. Oil painting could paint these materials as they had never before been painted. There were also paintings whose subjects were taken from classical literature, subjects which today seem quite remote, unsubstantial, dreamlike. But this wasn't so when the pictures were bought. Classical mythology was part of the specialized knowledge of the privileged minority. And these paintings helped them to visualize themselves whilst displaying the classic virtues, making the classic gestures. The paintings were the settings for charades in which they themselves would play. The props were given, the spirit of the performance was left to the owner's imagination. The figures were like garments held out for the spectator owners to put their arms into and wear. Here the daughters of the family dress up as graces decorating hymen. But the dressing up didn't have to be as literal as that. The spectator wore the clothes and played his part just in imagination. Who would you guess she was meant to represent? Different painters see her differently. But do these paintings have anything in common? And if so, what is it that they all convey? These pictures are all from the National Gallery and are all of Mary Magdalene. The point of the original story is that a prostitute so loves Christ that she repents of her past and comes to accept the mortality of flesh and the immortality of the soul. In each case, the way the picture is painted contradicts the essence of the story. The method of painting, the way of seeing, can only envisage her as being, before everything else, takeable. The hypocrisy is sexual. The title suggests sacred love. The painting, with title as alibi, speaks of profane love. Alternatively, she is simply a well-dressed, eligible young woman. The tangibility of her wardrobe, the elegance of her presence is all. It's a portrait that might have been painted of her for her future husband on the occasion of their betrothal. What I'm saying applies least of all to landscape painting or to the great late masters of landscape painting like Constable or Turner or Monet. But even there in the development of landscape painting, the faculty of oil painting to celebrate property did play a certain role. This is what Sir Kenneth Clarke says about Gainsborough. At the very beginning of his career, his pleasure in what he saw inspired him to put into his pictures backgrounds as sensitively observed as the cornfield in which are seated Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. This enchanting work is painted with such love and mastery that we should have expected Gainsborough to go further in the same direction. But he gave up direct painting and evolved the melodious style of picture making by which he is best known. Now look at it another way. The way I would use it for my argument. They have become not a couple in nature, as Rousseau imagined nature. Theirs is private land. Look at their attitude towards it. The attitude is visible. If a man stole a potato at that time, he risked a public whipping. 
The sentence for poaching was deportation. Without doubt, among the principal pleasures this painting gave to Mr. and Mrs. Andrews was the pleasure of seeing themselves as the owners of their own land. And this pleasure was enhanced by the ability of oil paint to render this land in all its substantiality. The surrealist painter, Magritte, commented on this faculty of oil painting. The painted landscape stands in for the real one. A number of great painters used oil paint to express their own highly personal and exceptional visions. They, in many ways, contradict my argument. They also contradict the tradition from which they sprang. This picture by Rubens celebrates the park and farmland surrounding the chateau he lived in. But the chateau and its owners are far away. Hunting is free. The fields are golden. The landscape is like a counterpane on a bed. It is a painting which goes beyond its traditional category. It is not a painting about a castle and its lands. On the contrary, it shows a world without scarcity, a world of plenty, a world, that is, which contradicts the entire history of private property. There's a painting of a woman by Vermeer, which at first sight confirms everything I have said. It would seem to be the ideal illustration of my argument. She is weighing gold in a pair of scales, or perhaps also weighing the pearls strewn on the table. Her interest is commercial. In the way the scene is painted, the substantiality and tangibility of everything is emphasized. Everything suggests the solidity of a Dutch middle-class home, even the painting of the Last Judgment on the wall behind her. A painting on the wall is a mark of prosperity. But go on looking. Gradually the painting becomes more mysterious, less easily explainable in my terms. The light falls on her face, on her fingers, on the scales, on the pearls. The moment has been preserved. And as we